Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the 14th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014? Can I remind all those present that electronic devices should be switched off because they interfere with the broadcasting system? Our first item today is to decide whether to take item four in private and to consider our work programme annual report and stage one report on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill in private future meetings. Are members agreed? Uh, we're agreed. Thank you very much. Before I move on to uh, item two, uh, can I just uh, welcome uh, uh, Joan. Uh, Joan's back with us. Uh, Joan McAlpine is here uh, in replace uh, of Colin Beattie, who is absent today, and Joan substituting. And I've also got Liz Smith, who's here, uh, obviously, as a member of the Parliament and interested in this particular bill. So welcome to you both. Uh, our next item is to hold our final evidence session on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Can I welcome Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, and her accompanying officials to welcome to all of you uh, this morning. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks? Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I, I know the committee will have questions based on the written and oral evidence and also on their visit to Orkney. I understand you are blessed with fair weather and a warm welcome, um, so I'll, I'll make a short statement only. In creating the Historic Environment Strategy, our place and time, uh, we worked with the sector at their request to agree a shared vision for Scotland's historic environment. Uh, it is based on three priorities, understanding what we have, caring for our shared heritage and valuing it for itself and the benefits it can bring to Scotland. So by uh, working together across the many bodies in the sector, we can care better for our heritage and deliver so much more for Scotland, not just sustainable economic growth, but benefits including skills, employment, education, enjoyment, sense of place and identity. So we're charting new ground here. Uh, I am excited by that. And to move forward, we will need to pool information and effort. And we will need to break away from the, the silo mentality for which the sector has been criticised in the past. I welcome the positive reception which the strategy has received in Scotland and beyond, and which signals widespread recognition of the need for new ways of working. So the relationship between the strategy, the bill, and the new body is important, and each complements each other. The sector asked for a strategic approach, and we were delighted to lead the process of collaborative production. To coordinate the strategy going forward, I will have the help of a board invited from key stakeholders, including the chair of Historic Environment Scotland's once selected, and I hope to announce the names of those who have agreed to assist me uh, with this task very soon. The vision is shared, but participants remain responsible through their own lines of governance. Ministers and Historic Environment Scotland will do everything they can to support the strategy, but others have to step up to the mark too. So the bill now before Parliament, which you are now considering, will create Historic um, Environment Scotland, uh, which is part of Ministers' contribution to achieving the vision set out in the strategy. The bill sets out the functions um, against which Historic, Scot uh, Scot Historic Environment Scotland will be expected to deliver and against which its success will be judged. And like all public bodies, Historic Environment Scotland will have its own appointed and regulated board responsible through ministers to Parliament. I will take forward the, the search for members as soon as the parliamentary progress permits. Um, in this bill, we have set out the functions of a body to operate within a strategic framework with simpler processes, with more transparency and with a more collaborative ethos. It will sustain the range of vital functions which Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission carry out. And I want to record my personal appreciation, convener, of the professionalism and enthusiasm of the staff of both bodies. And I expect Historic Environment Scotland to offer leadership, and I'm confident that it will earn that role based on the knowledge and commitment of the staff it will inherit. I recognise the huge part played by many others, especially the many thousands of private owners of our heritage, but also our local authorities, as well as independent bodies such as the National Trust for Scotland. That is why our new model is centred around wide strategic partnerships with Historic, Scotland, um, Historic Environment Scotland positioned as a lead partner. And our, tension, our intention is to support collective action towards a shared vision as set out in our place and time. So I believe the new body and the changes in the bill will make it easier for everyone concerned to play their full part in tackling the challenges which face Scotland's heritage. Those challenges will take time to tackle. Um, everyone recognises that understanding, protecting and valuing Scotland's historic environment is a long-term task. I, I believe it is a job that can be done, but only if we pull together. And with that, Convener, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, from the committee on the bill. Yeah, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, as you say, we do have a number of questions uh, across a number of areas uh, we want to cover this morning, but I'm going to begin um, with Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, the policy memorandum and financial memorandum have set out various points. Um, set out at various points some of the expected benefits of the bill, um, and some of these include um, opportunity for collaboration in, within the culture portfolio, and influence in other areas of, of policy, including placemaking, regeneration, health and well-being, and also um, a, a feed into the curriculum for excellence. I wondered if you would be um, able to just say a few, a few words about those benefits and also to explain um, why a merger was, was chosen to achieve those benefits and whether other consideration was given why merger is the best way forward. Well, very far back in terms of the, the period in 2011-12, we, we did look at all the different options. We had various options appraisal that led us to the decision that merger was the correct option. I, I will emphasise that one of the key aspects was to maintain and sustain the vital functions of both our CAMS and Historic Scotland, and that was um, something that we responded to. But it's been quite clear for some time, this is not a new idea that you might bring these two bodies together, um, but it was uh, certainly the appropriate time that we could take that forward and indeed uh, I think you've now heard from both um, commissioners and also from Histor uh, Historic Scotland that actually there's now an agreement that this is an appropriate way to go forward. In terms of the, the practical benefits which I think you're, you're referring to, certainly on education there's a huge amount of synergies between what RCAMs do and what Historic Scotland do. They both have exemplary education activity but that can be better worked together. Um, in terms of a big agenda for uh, Scotland and I think this government and, and Parliament is placemaking and a lot of the issues around town centre regeneration, if you're looking at towns, many of them are, have historic um, buildings in them. The work that RCAMs do in terms of its records and surveying, plus the work that um, Historic Scotland does in relation to repair grants, um, town centre regeneration, and indeed some of the grant funding that's helped coordinate also with other parts of government. That's a clear agenda area that's important. And also in terms of the strategic decision making, that you know, historic environment is not just something that we enjoy that is some kind of a backdrop to our country. It is actually a lot of the passion lifeblood that people feel very strongly about. And in terms of our um, health and well-being and in terms of some of the agenda, agendas that we have, you know, about getting people outside, about people feeling in control of their own places, which is a, a big agenda item. One of the things we want to try and do is make sure historic environment can have influence across all the different areas, and rather it being, you know, separate, uh, a, a separate kind of area which is just dealt with in terms of um, historic buildings in isolation, it allows influence. So one of the things that we've done already is to move the strategic policy aspects of historic Scotland into to central government, as in to the Scottish government. And we're already seeing good synergies and chances of influencing other government uh, agendas uh, in a way that uh, Historic Scotland didn't, didn't have. So I think that's, again, that's part of the prelude of, of taking this forward. So there are many sort of kind of practical things, um, but it's also talent. We've got talented people and it's to give them extra platforms to work on and career opportunities for many of the, the talented individuals as well. Uh, but it's not just about the bill, obviously, as you scrutinise it, is very much about the functions of this new body. Whereas, you know, in my opening remarks, I tried to set the context. It's, it's working in the wider strategy, and that means working with everybody else. And having that one lead body will help us do that as well. And it's, you know, there's transparency, efficiencies, and different things that we're, we're taking the opportunity to make sure happen with the, with the new body. Um, we, we, Cabinet Secretary, we did some evidence um, last week, which is... Um, very informative and it included representation from COSLA about working with the local authorities. Do you think the single body will, Im will improve working relationships and that partner relationship in Scotland? Yes, it will. And actually how we've gone about this, both the strategy and the bill is already um, helping that relationship with local authorities as well because it has been in collaboration and in relation to some of the issues around the, the transparency and in relation to planning, etc. We've worked very hard. I've worked with Councillor um, uh, Hagen in particular, um, who's got a keen interest and, and lead responsibility in, in this area. Um, in terms of putting the bill together, we consulted with the chief planning um, officers in relation to some of the provisions within that. But it's also about um, that sense of place, because if we're going to... The idea here is to make sure we've got, both from the strategy and from the new body, is to make sure that we've got um, a, a better opportunity for a historic environment. And, of course, it's place-based. You know, when people go to visit, you know, whether it's Orkney or whether it's West Lothian, they go to see what's in that area. Not all of it will be 
managed by Historic Scotland. Some of it will be from other partners, and clearly local authorities have a key role in how they promote in terms of you know, local promotion, uh, what they do in our local areas. So I, I think it will help there. Also, I think in relation to expertise and advice, um, that's something I know local authorities are very keen to make sure they can have access to. The bill makes it quite clear that we expect the, the, the um, HES to work with local authorities and continue to provide advice as they do. But I think what we are seeing now is an opportunity to share talent and information and expertise. It's not an excuse for local authorities not to do things, but what it does do is help provide um, a, a canvas that we've never really had before in this area. This is quite, you know, in my experience over this period, um, the historic environment has never really been a high on the agenda from local authorities' point of view. I'm glad now it is, and we're doing that in a shared way. So, for example, when we were discussing some of the strategy, I shared platforms with Councillor Hagan uh, spe specifically to, to share that. I know it was a different uh, councillor that came to speak to your committee, um, but that's my experience today. Thank you. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Just following up that, um, that point, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of the relationship with um, local authorities, um, obviously there's a, 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 a raft of areas where local authorities would, would expect to continue to, to, to play the lead. So in that collaboration, are you, uh, are you comfortable that the way in which the bill is set out it makes clear the, the, the areas where HES, in a sense, would be, would be taking the lead and, and those areas where local authorities would, would continue to, um, to, to, to take the lead? I'm thinking particularly in relation to um, some of the issues that developers, for example, have, and their, their first point of contact would, would inevitably be uh, the local authority rather than HES. So you, do you believe that the bill, as it's currently framed, makes clear that that relationship will, 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 will maintain? There wouldn't be an expectation for, um, uh, for, for de developers, for example, to go through, through HES um, en route to, the, to, to getting a decision from the council. Right, and there's um, different layers of this. Uh, actually, in terms of responsibility, by and large, everything in terms of the relationship will maintain because a lot of it will be underpinned by other pieces of legislation. And I think that's something that's come through in some of your evidence about um, like environmental assessments, etc. Now, they exist in other parts and other pieces of legislation. What we'll need to do is just re replace the name of Historic Scotland in some of those um, other pieces of legislation, secondary legislation, um, using, um, you know, it'd be, and again, it would come through secondary legislation so that Historic Environment Scotland appears where Historic Scotland used to appear. There will be some changes in the, um, the changes that will happen will be in relation uh, simply to uh, the streamlining uh, of processes where, in relation to um, applications that come to Historic Scotland, or uh, applications that come from developers to councils, can still con they will still consult uh, what will now be Historic Environment Scotland. That process will still be the same, and they'll be able to, the, the, the advice can still be provided. One of the things, however, we're doing is we're streamlining the process in, in such a way that if it affects a listed building, um, that we will not necessarily have to have the 28 days where there's a delay, which is actually one of the concerns that everybody has, that there's a delayed period. Um, we're also, because it's going to be a new body, once a decision is made, and again, the decision-making, and it's really important that, again, people understand decisions, decisions are made by local authorities. Um, they, you know, Historic Scotland or the new body provides advice to the local authority. Um, that if they're uh, in relation to um, listed buildings, or uh, there'll be an, an opportunity for appeal, and that's set out. So in relation to the, the bill, the, the only difference now is there's an appeal mechanism and, and it, that then uh, there's an opportunity to come to ministers in that, in that case. So we're streamlining the position. It should provide a bit more clarity as to the current position. It, by and large, remember, it's still the planning authorities that make that decision. And most of the changes that are, um, the only changes that are in here are related to the management of the historic aspects of this listed building or scheduled monument consent. That's the bits that are related to the bill. So in terms of are we, you know, making, would, it, would I say we're making considerable changes to relationship? No, we're not. Um, if anything, we're making it simpler, and that's actually what local authorities are very pleased about because we're actually potentially removing a 28-day uh, uh, delay, as people might see it, in, in some of the processes. So we're, st we're streamlining it, just as we're trying to do that with other aspects of with the planning legislation. But the bill is quite limited in what it does in relation to that. I mean, that, that that's helpful. It, it does seem to 
be the case that where there are concerns, they're, they're more about um, perhaps uh, in an effort to um, explain the benefits of, of the merger. There, there is perhaps a, a risk of, of that being interpreted by some that HES becomes a one-stop shop for, for, for developers, but that's quite explicitly not the, not the case. No, it's not. I mean, that, that still stands. Planning legislation is dealt with separately, and obviously there's been a big consultation um, uh, in terms of, of, of taking that forward separately. Okay, thank you very much for that, Liam. Uh, Liam's opened up this issue of the Historic Environment Scotland's role, and certainly we've had a number of um, organisations and individuals who have contacted us seeking clarity in what the role will be. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in, in exactly where the dividing line is. It's maybe a difficult uh, question to answer, but I mean, effectively, my understanding is obviously that uh, uh, the delegated properties in care, the 345 properties that are, will be delegated to Historic Environment Scotland, it has it will have direct responsibility for those. What other areas or properties will it have direct responsibility for? Or is it just well, the three, four, five? I think, I think it's really important to, 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 to reinforce the position that, that ministers will still be responsible and own the properties they own. And ministers will still have the agreement where it's a, a guardianship, for example. The relationship will be, again, directly between ministers um, and the individuals that put it into put, put the properties into care, we will then delegate, and that's why if you look at the the functions, um, I think it's function it's part three of the bill um, in part one. Part one, um, section three, talks about delegation. So we will delegate um, functions. So in terms of of properties and who looks after them, well, actually in in reality, it will be the same people in the same places as the excellent and skilled, you know, uh, I'm sure you, you met some of the Historic Scotland stewards when you were in Orkney. Um, but what we're doing is we're, you know, we will have a relationship with the new body in terms of formally setting out how they will manage those uh, properties for us. Is that what you're... Um, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to be clear about the direct responsibility that HES will have in terms of a historic environment. So effectively, it will be the 345. Yes. yes. But beyond that, no. Um, well, again, it's, it's setting up the opportunities to... Uh, if I say, I mean, yeah, some of the evidence we got was... Uh, trying to, we had this last week and we had it in some of the written evidence, the idea that um, uh, effectively Historic Environment Scotland will be responsible for about 8%. Um, another 92% uh, will be other bodies will be responsible for. Um, so I, I'm just trying to clarify exactly what their role, because they will be the lead body. I mean, you yeah. made a lot well, of the fact well, that they will have the lead role. The, the, vast, well, the vast majority mm. of um, historic buildings are not um, in public, have you know, public ownership responsibility. They're in, in private private ownership and private responsibility. So therefore, but that doesn't mean that, you know, historic environment Scotland doesn't work with them. So, for example, we're living, you know, we're in a city where, you know, well, put it this way, I, yesterday I was at a, the Apprenticeship Week launch, um, great exhibition, if you can get up to St Andrew's Square, where the apprentice is working with traditional skills. Across Scotland, there are 20% of our buildings are what we would call historic buildings, as in pre-1920, right? So in terms of, you know, that's the, the kind of the makeup of buildings across Scotland. In Edinburgh, that's far, far greater. In certain cities, it's far greater. Our responsibility here for the, you know, in terms of government, um, is for the kind of 345 properties in care in different shapes or form. That's why in terms of, and then, um, so you've got your private, you know, you've, I think historic houses you've, uh, association you've heard from, um, you've got the private individual owners of pre-1920 properties, you've then got a number of charities of which NTS is, is obviously the, the biggest one. Um, so part of the, why, why we need to, to work collaboratively is that we're actually working with a huge range of different, different people. Now in terms of lead, um, they still have a responsibility to drive forward um, a lot of the improvements that are taking place. Things that are um, really important, improvements in conservation, improvement tackling climate change, a lot of the issues around um, energy loss are in old buildings. So therefore, in terms of skills, I would expect them to drive forward a lot of the skills agenda. Um, yesterday I saw the, the innovations in relation to sash and case windows for ordinary houses. So you know, they've got to take a lead in a whole range of different areas, but they will have to work with everybody else, which leads me to the relationship between the bill and the strategy. So take skills as an example. Um, I want them to be a key driver. That's in terms of my letter of guidance to them, in terms of what I expect to see in their corporate plan. Skills and traditional skills to help maintain and indeed 
cover some of the conservation backlog and all the rest of it, we'll have to, they, I would want them to take a lead in, but they'll have to work with other people in the area. And that's why I'm, uh, I'm very pleased for Ken Cal and I have had a number of meetings about the overall strategy, how we can actually pool our um, knowledge and experience in this area so that we can, across Scotland, tackle it. Now, some of it will be for big properties like Edinburgh Castle, Stirling Castle, or Killeen Castle from NTS. But actually, in terms of the historic environment, it also means helping Edinburgh World Heritage Trust here, um, individual house owners, um, in relation to their how they maintain their historic buildings. So, it's the, the canvas they, pay, they, they they work on is quite broad, and never mind the tourism aspects. And we've we've instigated the tourism opportunities. So, it, I think it's wrong just to think about the historic environment simply in terms of managing the properties in care, vital and important as it is, they also have a kind of policy, it's almost like a kind of how do they help in terms of um, developments and policy areas like the kind of the, the health check we've got on buildings that we launched with construction skills. So there's a huge amount of partners. I, I take it, you know, the, if I maybe explain it in this way, uh, I mean, the committee obviously deals with education. By and large, you know, you've got local authorities quite clear in the responsibility, statutory and government and, and its responsibilities. Working, as you know, in the culture and heritage sector, you're actually, the, the, in terms of the statutory locus, a lot of what you, you, is quite set out in managing the building, the processes, the planning, etc. But a lot of what happens is done by people working together without necessarily having a, you know, a big, uh, sort of, uh, I suppose, a directive from, from central government. So it's important to, to set out that the lead responsibility that we're seeing is not just about the management of buildings of, of, of what's in their care, it's actually how they help the sector deliver what the sector needs to deliver. I mean, that, that's, that's the nub of the, the issue, I think, we're trying to clarify. How far does HESS's duty go in terms of its duty to offer, pro, offer and promote leadership? Um, extend beyond in, into non-public sector bodies you know we had you, you said yourself we heard from the the private house owners and um, i think there's a there's a question there that people just want clarified and um, so they're sure about where the where the areas of responsibility lie and i think clearly um, as has been stated in the, the government's documents um historic environment scotland's role is to investigate care for and protect the historic environment but is it all of the historic environment I mean, where effectively does it it's a very difficult thing to to define, but I, mean, I understand the difficulties here. But it, there is clearly a, a, a slight concern, or, a, or, a, or a people seeking an understanding of exactly the role of historic environment Scotland um, and how it fits into the picture of um, private ownership, other bodies, charitable organisations, and if, if HES has got this role, this overarching role, how that fits into what they, how they operate. Okay, well, let's start with, the, if we start with the strategy, um, I'll be appointing a strategic board that will bring together, you know, historic environment interests, and um, that will have lead, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not in a position to tell you exactly will be on it, but it will be key players across all the sector, whether it's local government, independent charities, private interest etc and the idea is collectively we'll agree common goals that we need to take forward to deliver the strategy which has had a warm welcome in terms of activity some of the areas that it's not unreasonable you would expect it to, to cover would be areas like skills for example it would be um, energy conservation issues kind of what the factors that affect all of us whether we're government or local government or um, private house owner or wherever so that will happen at that level. In relation to the body itself, a lot of the things that we'll do will be exactly the same as our CAMS and, and Historic Scotland have already been doing. Um, one of the key things they do is provide grants, for example, and they will continue to do that. Um, one of the things that's quite clear in, in terms of uh, what I've tried to do as, go as Government Secretary is to, despite the reduction in my overall spending, um, I've maintained, I've made sure we've maintained the level of grant. Now, one of the issues then is how do they continue, to, they will continue to do that. So they'll continue to give grants to different areas. It might evolve over time, but by and large, you know, that will continue as a function. In terms of its statutory responsibilities, they will, they will maintain. Some of it's actually covered in other pieces of legislation. So for example, this committee in a previous life 
um, scrutinise the historic environment amendment legislation, the bill that I took through, which allowed um, different things that the HS could do in relation to, for example, where um, intervene where there are buildings which are particularly in dangerous or other facilities, giving powers to local authorities to, to maintain. These things will still happen. These things will still happen. But what we're doing is we're providing a better platform um, in relation to one body. Um, the functions are set out. Our CAMs have been very pleased that for the first time their functions or the areas of responsibility for are now set, uh, responsible for are now set out in in the bill. So. If, I, if we try and reassure that actually the maintenance and the relationship of the historic environment will, will continue, but it will provide a better platform to help the collaboration with all the different, different partners. So I, I think if people are expecting it, it's going to be a brand new, it will be a new body. And that's what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's bringing together a new, a new body. But a lot of the functions will be the inherited functions that already, already exist. But I just think we'll be in a better place to collaborate with all the other different areas. And we've now got... We're doing it within the context of the strategy, which is the first time we've ever had that. Yeah, that that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, supplementary from Liz Smith. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I just clarify something? Um, paragraph 88 uh, in the policy memorandum uh, it says that Scottish ministers will be able to give directions to Historic Environment Scotland about the exercise of its functions, but not on specific cases, objects or properties, uh, presumably to ensure operational independence. And then in section 12.3 of the bill, it says that that doesn't apply where Scottish ministers have the delegated functions in relation to the properties and care, i.e. these 345 uh, properties that you mentioned earlier. And in a letter uh, to the Delegated Powers and Reform uh, Law Reform Committee, the Scottish Government has confirmed that at subsection 3, it makes clear that ministers may, by contrast, give directions in relation to what would be considered curatorial matters in relation to those properties in care and collections. So could we just be absolutely clear about the powers that the Scottish Government actually has in terms of directing HES, just as uh, the convener was asking? Well, I've already referred to Section 3 being the, the point about the delegation of functions, and that's for the management of functions. And this is kind of very similar to the extent um, of the, the, the committee had looked at the National Libraries of Scotland Bill when we were looking at making sure there's no curatorial interference with exhibitions or how they actually manage, their, uh, manage, manage the estate. Um, however, we have to have a check and balance on that side with the point that we still own, the, you know, on behalf of the, the people of Scotland, the, the properties. Now, I'll give you an example. So something happened at Stirling Castle, for example, where uh, we had concerns about how it was being um, maintained uh, because, again, we are responsible for it. We will have to have some kind of power to, to have a relationship with them to say, look, we have concerns about how you know, Stirling Castle is being maintained. Can you look into this? Um, but most of that would be dealt with by the letter of guidance, the corporate plan, and plans that will do, they'll produce on a year-to-year -year basis. So we, we, we have to make sure there's a bit of it. Again, it's the check and, checks and balances. I don't think people would accept a situation where everything was transferred um, to Historic Environment Scotland and ministers uh, you know, abdicated their responsibility completely from make su making sure that in terms of the key, and most of them will be the main properties that are being looked after properly. Just on, on the point that the convener raised about uh, the extent to where uh, you make the dividing line, are you confident that, that that is absolutely clear about where Scottish ministers have responsibility? Yes, because I, I, I think, you know, apart from anything else, uh, politically, uh, this committee and indeed others, in terms of our interference, if they thought that we were interfering overly, would certainly come down with us in a, a ton of bricks, as would um, the sector itself. So there has to be that balance between not abdicating complete responsibility, but also because, again, you know, this committee will want to hold me, me to account for, you know, the, 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 uh, the ownership and responsibility of particularly our key sites. But we also have to make sure that I don't interfere and say, right, it's Sterling Castle, you will hold an exhibition on X at the time. I want you to make it because that could be open, and people might interpret that being open to political interference, etc. And we, you know, that's not acceptable. I know it wasn't acceptable under the National Libraries Bill, and uh, neither is it uh, acceptable here. But there has to be that relationship between the two things in relation to, um, you know, the delegation of functions, but also in relation to acknowledging that there will be um, a, an issue that we have to, you know, in terms of. Uh, Exercise 12, which uh, part 12, which sets out directions um, and guidance. 
So, you know, direction must be given in uh, writing. We must publish directions, given our guidance. And, you know, we can't do anything quietly about this. This is going to be quite open up front. And uh, I think that's also the transparency I'm saying that it's bringing, this bill is bringing, means that actually both Historic Environment Scotland's actions will be more transparent and, indeed, Scottish Government's actions will be more transparent. Thank you. Uh, Neil Bowie. Thanks, Camina. Just to um, wonder if you could just clarify, um, in terms of um, the Scottish Minister's intended to delegate management of, of properties to HES and the powers that um, ministers will, will have, can, can you confirm, uh, what, are there any historic properties that HES will manage that they may not be subject to ministerial direction over curatorial matters? Well, though... Uh, if can we just correct me if we're wrong, but I think it will be in relation to some of the properties in care that are not under the ownership of um, the Scottish Government. That would be that would be the areas. Is that? I think. Sorry, I think for all the properties in care which have been delegated, then that power of uh, direction as, as an ultimate resort, as the Cabinet Secretary has described it, uh, if things are going wrong, would uh, apply. So it would apply to the whole thing, whether or not they're owned or whether or not they're covered by guardianship agreement, because the ultimate responsibility for the whole of that set of properties still rests with ministers. So this is back to the ministers making sure that things are done properly in generic terms while not interfering in uh, the day-to-day -day running decisions. So it's very unlikely it, we, would, we were saying about a, a, an individual property. It would tend to be more in the, you know, each year in letter of guidance, the issues to do with a general category or et cetera. Um, can I ask you as well, Minister, in your correspondence with the committee, you've said you're going to uh, lay an order under, I think, Section 3, Subsection 3, I think, to add Historic Environment Scotland to the list of public bodies after Stage 1. Um, can I ask why are you doing this after Stage 1 and not after Stage 3, when the Parliament's going through the whole uh, process? Um, more so that we can move uh, swiftly and efficiently. It's not too dissimilar to what we've done elsewhere. Obviously, the will of Parliament has to be respected, and if it's stage three, Parliament said, we don't want this bill, then we'd have to just stop in our tracks. And, however, um, having gone through a number of um, mergers over the six years of my responsibility as a minister, I mean, one of the things that I've absolutely always made clear is make sure you get the pensions correct of staff, you know, if you're changing bodies, or some of the practicalities, particularly that affect staff. So I'm I'm very keen that we can move forward. The references were made to um, other pieces of legislation because Historic Environment Scotland as a body doesn't exist and referenced in other, in other um, parts of legislation. We need to move quite quickly to make sure that they can then be inserted into the relevant piece of legislation, whether it's for you know, strategic environment, etc. But certainly on the pension side, um, I'm very keen that we move forward. And that's what Section 3 um, in relation to the, the order allows us to try and move to make sure that we've got everything, all our ducks in a row, ready for when the body takes power and, and responsibility um, formally, which we think will be around about October 2015. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, George Adam. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. There's been much uh, talk during the evidence sessions on defining the historic environment. You know, it's not the actual definition isn't on the bill, but it's, uh, it's part of the strategy. Now, uh, in your opinion, Cabinet Secretary, you know, is, is the strategy robust? Is it enough for everyone to know exactly what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, that's why the, the importance of the, the strategic, you know, strategic document is the one that has everybody's brought together in terms of what they're all um, signed up to and what they're all supporting. And, and it's been quite a remarkable process in, in bringing everyone together and in that collaboration. And indeed, it was a, a, you know, a subject of quite a lot of debate um, as the, for the preparation of this. Indeed, um, and again, I think the, we, when we had the parliamentary debate in the chamber here, again, um, that was something that was raised as part of that debate. The, the, the key feedback was that uh, from the sectors, they wanted it uh, in the strategy and they wanted it to be fairly um, straightforward and uh, fairly simple rather than complex. And that's actually what um, everybody, you know, that was the feedback we had and that's what we responded to. Um, I think there, there is limitations if you put things in, in, in legislation, because remember, the historic environment is not just, this is a bill for setting up the body. The actual wider, it comes back, to, I think, to the convener's point about the responsibilities of being wider in terms of the wider historic environment, and it's the uh, wider sector that has agreed the strategy um, and also the, the content and the definition that's in that. I think there is a danger that things can change. Um, I think one of the big debates we're having, again, Rob Gibson raised it during the parliamentary debate, was intangible culture. 
Um, this is where I would perhaps depart from the, the rest of the UK in that um, the Westminster government you know, is not wanting to sign up to UNESCO's kind of statements on intangible heritage. I think intangible heritage is a big part of um, our heritage. It's not just the physical places. It's the stories that go with that. It's the dance, it's the music, etc. Um, so I think that we'll probably see these kind of issues evolve over time. Um, and I think the flexibility that we have within the strategy is where people expect to see it, and, and that's where it is. I was interested in looking at some of the evidence about, well, look at what SNH has done, but it looked at what SNH has done. There doesn't set out the boundaries. All it does is say it can include. It's an inclusive. It's one by inclusive. So, it, you know, you can load things in. It doesn't necessarily help the boundaries of where else you work. But, um, again, I, I really want to reinforce that what this allows us to do with the bill, but most importantly, the strategy, is working with local authorities, working with other um, the bodies in this sector, that's where the boundaries come from. It's collaboration because, you know, things are, you know, the public finances are, are, are pressed. Um, there are big challenges, whether it's climate change or other things, and we cannot do this by one body alone. We're going to have to work uh, collectively. So I think trying not to be too prescriptive about that in a bill um, would be helpful because we'd end up having to probably review that. And I said I'm not convinced by just having one that includes everything but doesn't exclude anything, it's going to be helpful. I think that was one of the things Cabinet Secretary came up with our trip to Orkney was the fact uh, that all the groups working together, uh, particularly it may have been because of the, the geography involved in Orkney, but it's something we definitely need more groups in other areas of the country to do that. But more on the tangible side, if I've got this correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, Cabinet Secretary, but you know, is it because we've not got the definition because it's fluid, it's constantly changing? Like a perfect example of it would be when I was a youngster going on a run to Largs, I would drive through Greenock and would see hundreds of cranes. Uh, but then, you know, the minute the yards were away, they weren't part of the historic environment. But yet in Glasgow, we've still got Finiston, we've got the crane at Finiston. There's one crane left, it's part of the environment, the industrial heritage. You know, that wasn't regarded as part of our historical environment possibly about 30 years ago. But now it's something that we're looking about, my own constituency, old mill buildings and things like that as well, you know, parts of the industrial heritage that we have, you know, is that not just an example of why you don't have the definition, because it is pretty fluid? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, uh, we've, I mean, but it's an interesting area, I mean, I've I'm, I'm been very keen to support our our industrial heritage, but of course a lot of the industrial her heritage currently, and I think it's the way forward, is actually married by, you know, managed by our museums. So one of the things I have done is bring together the industrial museums together. Um, they have a federal uh, model. I worked with Henry McLeish actually on, on setting that up. Uh, they now get direct funding from the Scottish Government. Um, it's why we've done we've invested hugely in the um, the National Mining Museum, um, and also for those of you who are, are in the, um, if you're ever down in Irvine, the Scottish Maritime Museum now has a roof that is there on a, that doesn't let in, it did have a roof before, but it let in water. And Sam Gilbrace said to me, uh, he's the, the chair, he said he never thought he'd see the, you know, see, see the, the, the repairs done uh, during a government in the, in the time we did it, and, and we did, and it's allowed it to have, you know, for, a year-long kind of, uh, you know, uh, exhibitions and events and different things. So, but if we were then to start to include industrial heritage in this, then the museums, understandably, would have concerns, and that's where the boundaries are. It's better we actually work in cooperation. So what's better in cooperation is saying, OK, let's look at Irvine or, or other areas, saying what's in that locality, work with North Ayrshire um, Council and look at all the different historic buildings that are there and collaborate in terms of promoting the tourism aspect. And you, within that area, you, you probably find different, um, either Historic Scotland or National Trust or others, as well as Industrial Heritage. But I think it, yeah, the, your, your point about the fluidity, I think, is well made. But the important thing is we just get on and do it. And I think that's what I'm very enthused about. And I did say I was in my opening remarks, I am excited about what we can do. Um, and there's a real energy about the sector in taking this forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Just following that up, um, in relation to the, the, the definition, I mean, it talks about Scotland's historic environment as the physical evidence for human activity that connects people with place linked with the associations we can see, feel and understand, which is fairly broad, would encompass what George Adam was talking about, would encompass the, the wartime um, history in my own constituency, which is in, in increasing in terms of uh, relevance and, and importance. And I think the point that was being made to us by... Um, some of those that were giving evidence, and there was, a, a, I think, a mixed picture in terms of the views, um, was that 
where as with um, the establishment of SNH, there was a definition of, of, of natural heritage. I mean, it, was, it was broad, it was inclusive, it didn't necessarily exclude. But in a sense, it gave it a position that um, if we were not to adopt a similar approach in terms of the historic environment, would create an imbalance between um, uh, the, the standing of the two in, in, in legal terms. That was, the, the, I think, the point that was being made to us. So while I don't... I, I, I'm struggling to see from the, defi from the explanation you've given why adopting a similar approach to the one for, for, for SNH, um, you couldn't do the same in, in, in terms of the historic environment without running into any particular problems legally or, or, or whatever. Well, I, and I've always taken the view, if you don't need to put something in legislation, you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't you know, just do it as a window dressing or, 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 or from that perspective. Um, uh, and also, I think even if you look at your, your, your own written evidence and indeed what we've had from the stakeholders, there's, there's not been any big demand of us as a government that this should be in the bill. And we would have picked that up in the consultation for the, for the bill or our discussions. It's not, it's not been a, a burning issue for people that this needs to be there. They're more interested in taking the, the strategy forward. And indeed, I think some of the evidence that I've, I've read and the feedback we've had is actually they think it's better having it in the strategy because that actually you can work with that. Um, if it's in the bill and things change, you then start to... Because then if you start doing that, what will happen? If we were to put this in the bill, say at stage two, you'll have everything. Well, why is my not bit in it for stage three? And you'll end up having a definition that will be broad and it will end up being, you know, large and extensive, and you'll end up then alienating people who say, well, hang on, my part of the definition isn't there. Now, we've gone through this because that's exactly what we did in, in, in developing the, the definition that we had, because we started with something that was broader and was more encompassing and more inclusive, a bit like SNH, and actually the feedback from the sectors, no, that's not what we want. You know? In fairness, I think while it wasn't a view shared across those who gave us evidence, there were, um, there were uh, a number of witnesses who did feel quite strongly about it. Now, whether or not you put it on the face of the bill, primary legislation, or whether you find another mechanism for um, enshrining this uh, in a similar way to the, uh, to the way in which natural environment uh, was enshrined in the establishment of SNH, that would be, a, I think, an open question. But the, the, the point, I think, was, was, was validly made, that if, if you were to compare the position of natural environment as compared to historic environment, there does seem to be an, a, an imbalance in the way that they're uh, treated uh, under law. But I don't think it stops people doing their, their job. And I think that's the most important thing, is getting on and doing the, doing the work. I don't think it would, would it add anything being in the, the bill. I'm not sure what it would actually add being in the bill. And the bill is not actually about... The bill is not actually about um, legislation for the wider historic environment. The bill is just about setting up a new body and just about setting up the historic environment of Scotland um, and bringing together the two organisations and setting out um, some, you know, as it says on the long title of the bill, um, if you read the long title of the bill, um, to make minor amendments to the law relating to the historic environment. This is not about defining the historic environment. Most of that's done, as I said, in, in, in terms of the, the, the activity by other pieces of legislation. This is actually about setting up an organisation. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I accept and, you know, uh, the views that were given to us during the strategy that they didn't want it in the bill. If they'd wanted it in the bill, it would have been in the bill from the start, but that's why it's in the strategy. I mean, I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah, I, no, think, I think there, there, there is a difference of opinion, and that was expressed to us in, 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 in Orkney during our visit as well. So there's, there's, there's not a unanimity of view on this. I fully accept yeah, that. But, but the balance of it overwhelmingly is on one side. But no, I agree with you that there are different ways you can approach this, and that's why we did look at what I think it should have done, but I don't think it adds to the function of the organisation to which the bill refers to. OK, thank you. Uh, Jane Baxter. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, both the NTS and the Historic Houses Association Scotland have calculated that their combined repair backlog totals around £103 million. The NTS has expressed concern about the Scottish Government's intention to transfer management responsibility of the properties in care to HES, saying it's not clear who will be responsible for any associated repairs. So I'm wondering if you'd like to comment on that and, and tell us this morning who will be responsible for carrying out repairs to the properties in care when HES assumes management responsibility for them and what's the estimated cost of the repair backlog? Uh, 
Um, well, uh, in terms of, again, re referring to, to previous answers, the Scottish ministers will be responsible for the properties, but we will delegate the functions to um, Historic Scotland. As, as, as you realise, I will not personally be responsible for the repair and maintenance of them all. However, in terms of the, the responsibility to make sure that, that we have adequate funds to do that, that would still remain with us. Um, and we would then provide in our letter of grant, etc., what would be provided to the bodies. You make a very good point about the importance of our heritage environment and the conservation um, that's required um, and the maintenance and it is it is a large amount and we're in the process of putting that together and um, a lot of that depends on the baselines as to what you expect it to be as to work out what has to be done you can do things in either um, a very kind of quick way about quick maintenance so you can make sure you're you know really going into to um, conservation that stands a longer period of time so we're trying to work out the baseline it's one of the areas I'm very keen for the strategic board that I'm putting together that brings NTS and others to look at how do we as the whole sector look at what's required and um, some of the methodology that NTS has done in carrying out their audit is we're looking at that as to apply to to HS HS are looking themselves at how we actually then quantify this um, it is a big task and um, I would help help um, I would hope that the committee would support me in any budget discussions going forward. If we want a strong tourism sector, we need to make sure our properties are open and able to be visited. Um, and that means that you know, investment in the historic environment in terms of capital is really, really important. Um, and that's not just a kind of even a one spending review commitment. That's a long term area. Um, so it, it's a big problem. I can't give you a figure just now, and I think it would be wrong for me to, to do so. It is a substantial amount, um, but I think it would be wrong for me to give you a, um, a figure at this stage. It's never been done by the previous Labour Liberal Democrat administration, never took the opportunity to look at the historic backlog of, of what was there. It's never been done before. So, you know, give me some kind of, uh, if you can give me some grace to actually you know, put this together, uh, because we do think it's a big task, but we want to get it right, and uh, we want to then be able to, if you don't know what the, the issues are, how can you take that going forward? We do know um, on a standing basis of what's required in terms of repair and maintenance, etc. But what we're talking about and what NTS are talking about is looking at this as in, a, in, in terms of the long term kind of um, aspects. You've been up at Orkney now. If I was to say the seawall in terms of some of the, the, the properties up there, the expense of that is, is, is millions. I mean, I'm sure you got the kind of extent of that. And even if we did that, there's a real risk there. So some of these costs are not. Um, you know, you can do mitigation. I was at the Weems Caves, for example, in Fife. You can do mitigation work if you wanted there, but we know from what's happening in terms of sea levels, it really is vulnerable. So trying to quantify what that means in terms of, 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 of cash investment is a real challenge. So it is a lot, it will be a significant amount of money. Don't you? I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that. Um, but it's a, a task that hasn't been done, done up to date, but I have tasked them to do that. And I think it's a good collaborative model working with um, other organisations and NTS have just done that recently. I'm going to ask, is there a timescale for that work to be done? Is it a priority for the new organisation? Um, what is it? How long will that it's take? A work, it's, a, it's a work in progress. I've already seen sort of early indications of, of the work they have, but I'd rather they worked, they did, they did it correctly, because then all that would happen is that if we came up with a figure, we'd have to come back and readjust it. But don't worry, I mean, it is, it's, uh, it is significant. Um, but we have to have to tackle it. But just because it's big and difficult doesn't mean you don't start it. And that's why we're trying to make sure that we can understand and then we can then prioritise prioritize where that investment um, might go in the future. And just briefly, Convener, thank you. Um, it's one of the things that we know that for the new body coming into being, they'll need to know, a stand, you know where they're going to be. So um, knows us indicated we're trying to aim for April 2015 so that they know what they're, you know, what they're coming into, the new board, the new, the new body. But um, we'll update the committee as we go on because it's clearly a, a, an area of interest. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you about the steps the Scottish Government's taken to ensure that the properties in care can legally be delegated to HES in the manner proposed? I know it's been spoken about this morning, but could you just take us through the steps and whether you think that they are robust enough and that they will be um, able to, to challenge it, to, to withstand any challenge that might be brought forward? Well, we've set out in primary um, legislation what the functions will be, what the delegated functions will be. That's what's in the, that's what's in the, in, in the legislation uh, here. But bearing in mind in terms of our responsibilities, remember in terms of the... Um, the relationship between either ourselves and as guardians, that relationship will still stand with Scottish ministers, and obviously the ownership of those that are within Scottish ministers' responsibility will still maintain as being 
in the ownership of Scottish ministers. Thank you. Thanks, Gavina. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Scanlon. I wonder if I could just ask a very brief question that came up uh, quite a lot in Orkney. Um, the organisations that we met, they seem to have quite a concern that this bill will lead to more central control compared to the decision making and the good relationships they have with the council, etc. at the moment. Uh, I just wonder, can you understand that concern? Is it a real concern or can you perhaps give some comfort to them that it shouldn't be a concern? It, it, it certainly shouldn't be a concern. It's not a function of this bill to do that. In fact, a lot of the operations of Historic Scotland currently in particular are very much decentralised um, and also in relation to the different regions that they have in terms of that. There's no reason why that shouldn't continue. And indeed, in relation to the responsibilities in the bill that talks about working um, in partnership, you can only do that if you do that on a locality basis. So again, uh, referring to, I think, the question from Claire Addison about relationship with local authorities, that's actually going to be strengthened by this because if you're looking at a place, and I've, I've used this example before, Stirling is a very good example where you've got um, the Wallace Monument that's um, the Stirling Council control, you've got NTS with Bannockburn, and you've got um, the you know, Scottish Government, well, Historic Scotland with the castle, Stirling Castle. Now, the, the sensible thing and what's happened there is the collaboration to make sure they promote the place, even though the responsibilities and the ownership are, lie in different hands. So, therefore, that placement, and remember, the placemaking agenda is very important to the government, the town centre regeneration. You can only do that with local decision making about those different areas. So, I think actually, with the strategy, moreover, that's probably going to take that, that, that further forward. But that's an internal management issue um, for Historic Scotland. But I, I suggest when they have the corporate plan, it's something. Something I would like to see surfaced and quite evident in that to give the reassurance that you're looking for, Mary. Certainly a matter of concern. I apologise for uh, throwing that one in. Uh, Mary, Mary, just, I know you want to move on to it, but I know Liam was very interested in this particular area, so if you don't mind, I'll ask him to do a supplementary on it before I come back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I, I listened with interest to the response. I think Mary Scanlon's absolutely right. It was a concern that came, uh, came through very strongly in, in Orkney. Um, I, 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 I can understand why framing this in the bill may be, um, may be difficult and the, the corporate plan may be a more appropriate place to, to look at this. But I, I think what was being suggested was that organisationally, um, in order to give effect to, to the sort of collaborative approach and the importance of place and all the rest of it, there was a need for the new organisation, um, not simply to kind of retrench to Edinburgh, as it were, and that, that what you would get is a more regionalised model, um, if you like, within um, HES. There have been examples, I think, pointed to in, in, other, um, in other public bodies and NDPBs. Um, but is that something where you think there may be a, a, a route through the bill, at least to signal um, in terms of the corporate plan, what, what, might, uh, what might be expected? I'm not sure if it's appropriate to be in, in the bill. Um, I think the internal management of Historic Scotland um, well, the historic environment of Scotland, as it will be, will not be any different. I don't think there's any major kind of difference in, in how it would approach its business in relation to, to place. Remember, you know, of these 345 properties, I mean, they are dispersed all over the country. So to do their business, they have to physically be in the different places. Um, in fact, uh, a considerable number of them are in Argyll and Butte, for example, in terms of the, the, the proportion in relation to, to elsewhere in Scotland. So, you know, there are central functions that are in um, for both ARCAMs and Historic Scotland that are here in Edinburgh would probably remain in Edinburgh. However, in terms of um, carrying out their functions and collaborations, we would expect that. And, and actually, in terms of even the people that are located in Edinburgh, a lot of them spend a considerable amount of time not in Edinburgh because they're actually visiting the different places that they have to do work, you know, have to work with. Um, so I think, the, I think the corporate plan is the right place to do that, I think uh, my ministerial direction to them, in terms of my ministerial letter of guidance, sorry, would be the, the you know the right place to put that. But I don't think having a merged body and a new lead body should affect affect that issue. I mean, I, I, obviously, as an organisation, already um, probably more so than, than many others, there is a, a, a kind of face of the organisation in, in in most parts of the, the the country, and that was certainly reflected from the evidence we heard in Orkney. I think the, the, the fear is that in, a, in an organisation that will be under some um, uh, budgetary uh, pressure in, in pulling together the organisation, that there may be um, 
pressure to, 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 to retrench positions um, uh, more centrally. And I think what people were looking for was a degree of comfort yeah. that it's not so much just that people are present in a location, but they have decision-making functions. They don't necessarily always have to be passing up the line um, decisions about what's, uh, what's done in a particular local area or, 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 or a particular region. Um, and again, as I say, I, I appreciate that putting that on the face of the bill may be problematic, but I think through the course of this bill process, what they're looking for is a, a degree of reassurance that that will not happen and that through the letter of guidance and through the corporate plan, your expectation would be um, something very different. Yeah, I mean, I, I very much appreciate the comments both from Ray Scallon and Lee McCarthy in this, in this area. I'm sure that might be reflected in what you see as a committee, and certainly um, I, I hear what you're saying in response to that, so that's something that we can respond to. Um, I really think it's the appropriate way to do that, but I'm sure it's an issue we can perhaps also raise when we discuss your report in Stage 1. Thank you very much. Can I go back to Mary now? Thank you. Oh, um, uh, you'll have uh, read the evidence from uh, Historic Houses Association and the National Trust. And uh, there was a real concern of the potential for tension uh, with Historic Environment being an owner of significant heritage assets, a tourist operator and a regulator. And they are also responsible for awarding taxpayer funded grants for the sector and at the same time they are in competition with the sector. Is, do you understand the concerns of the National Trust and Historic Houses and uh, you know, what can be done about this? Um, yeah, yes, I understand them. I think they're, they're genuine points of, of concern and indeed in my uh, several discussions with Sir Ken Kalman, the, the chair of NTS, I, I've discussed these points. That's why actually we've made quite clear in the policy memorandum um, the areas of transparency. So, for example, in relation to, if it, there's quite a lot in this convener. Is it okay if I, I, I'll try and work my way through because it's, it's an important area. The scheduled monument consent in particular, <coughs> that they would be regulating as well as obviously in, in their own position. Uh, the new body will not uh, have crown immunity, so it will be subject to the same scheduled monument consent process as, as um, as elsewhere. What people probably aren't aware of is there already is within Historic Scotland a system of scheduled monument consent process. Um, so it's called scheduled monument clearance and there's a scheduled monument clearance process just now, even before the new body, whereas internally the, you know, the, they're regulated in terms of what they have to do in relation to particular areas. Um, some very good examples. Recently, the Scottish National War um, Memorial in Edinburgh Castle, there was a request from the um, HS Conservation Directorate to do new plans to put in a new um, re reflection space. Um, and that was looked at internally by um, the regulatory arm. And they said, no, that's not where we want you to put this because we have concerns about it. And it was relocated. Uh, similarly, with Stirling Castle and the Visitor Centre, and there was the internal process picked up exactly the same way it would for anybody else in terms of the scheduled monument process. And one of the things that we've done specifically um, to address concerns um, that uh, somehow they would not be treating themselves the same as everybody else. I say they already are, even though they don't have to. There's a voluntary process. But in order to make sure it's absolutely clear that the regulatory function of Historic Scotland will apply the same functions to those applications coming from another part of the body as they are from MDA externally, um, we've made it quite clear that the, the decisions will, for the first time, be made public. So there'll be a transparency, so you can actually then see if there's a difference in terms of decision making. Um, in terms of um, your other areas, grant making, I think, is an important area. Um, currently, th there is, I mean, currently we don't provide capital to HS. It's only in relation to when they might administer, for example, five million to Bannockburn, to National Trust for Scotland, Cambria, the start of Scotland. Um, the, the funding that's provided um, is through uh, revenue, um, and it's provided via what we provide currently to Historic Scotland, that will conti continue. Um, but we've also made it quite clear in the policy memorandum that Historic Environment Scotland will not be able to provide grants to itself. Okay? So their funding will come from the overall, the overall um, funding that we provide. Because, again, um, it's a corporate, um, the corporate plan will make it quite clear where the funding is going and who it's going to. Um, should at some point in the future they decide to be a you know, become a charity, the level of transparency then for spending, uh, again, will make their, their expenditure proposals even more transparent. Um, and in terms of, of um, sustainability, 
despite the really difficult um, period that we've gone through, uh, as you understand from the, the Westminster Block Grant, etc., and the pressures on us, um, I have actually maintained the level of grant. I've said explicitly to Historic Scotland that the front level, the grants that go out, that go to small businesses doing work in town centres, etc., that you know, to other bodies, that must be maintained. And so we've actually managed to maintain that level. Um, I would be able to do that in terms of the new body, Historic Environment Scotland, I'd be able to do that by um, my letter of guidance again, or again, what I'd expect from the corporate plan and make it quite explicit that I would expect you to, I can't tell them which buildings, going back to the point about not being able to direct them to, you know, you will spend X amount on Arkett Castle, etc. What I can say is that, you know, I would expect the level of grant to go out to other bodies to be maintained at the level of, so I can do it in the generality. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'm almost more, con more confused than I was at the start. Um, it, you know, in, in t well, we heard last week that Historic Scotland's budget has gone down from 51 to 37 uh, million. Um, and as, if I heard you correctly, you said Historic, Scot Historic Environment Scotland will not be responsible for allocating to what's within their own what's within their own portfolio. So. I think I'm not the only one that's misunderstanding this. I mean, if historic houses have got 103 million backlog, that's not even looking at the needs of the National Trust uh, and various others. Um, so, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just not quite understanding this. I mean, the, this committee the budget has, has it... already fallen. Uh -huh. uh, Okay. Well, maybe to explain... So, where is the money coming from? Well, before you join the, the, this committee, um, the, the committee has spent a lot of time looking at the budgets for Historic, um, Historic Scotland and others. Um, and the overall, um, the overall amount of money that Historic Scotland has been able to spend on itself has basically um, maintained over the period. The balance, however, has shifted. And you know, we have, uh, you know, as part of our reductions elsewhere, we've reduced the overall funding that went to Historic Scotland. And um, they've managed to, through a whole variety of different programmes of efficiencies, without compulsory redundancies, managed to reduce the spend expenditure they have as an organisation. However, uh, one of the things I, I managed to do and I asked them to do was to maintain the grants that went to other third parties so that the third party investment that went to NTS, for example, the NTS, you know, between Historic Scotland and other government bodies received over £1 million last year from, you know, from Scottish Government. But um, what we've managed to do is to maintain the level of grants that were front facing that went to other organisations, big and small. So what they then have to do is um, the new body will do exactly the same as the current body is they then manage their own estate by whatever is remaining in terms of the funding from central government, but they can supplement that with income that they generate from their visitor activities. So, for example, in terms of um, their activity, they have done extremely well and increased the, their funding from those sources by 40% over the last period. So it meant when I came to the committee to give evidence on the budget, although there was concern about the overall government reduction to, to historic Scotland, we knew that they could maintain their activity both internally for their own properties but also in terms of what they give to other uh, third parties because their overall income um, had basically uh, you know had been in a, in a strong position um, over that over that period so in relation to the looking at historic scotland's um, overall income um, that has basically now uh, you know in 13 14 for example their overall expenditure was actually higher than the 2009-10 period, despite the fact that the, the, the issue from the, the amount they received from government had varied. In 9-10, their grants, this is to third parties, this is to Historic Houses Association members or NTS or indeed some of their town centre regeneration uh, cars funding, was in 2009-10, their Historic Scotland's expenditure and grants was 15 uh, 15. 15 and a half million in 1314 it was 15 million so we've managed to maintain the kind of level um, of funding for that so that's to try and explain is I, I currently am protecting the third party investment to historic houses and to NTS I've done doing that under the current arrangement the way I would do that under the new arrangement is I would do that by my letter of guidance to them in relation to what I expect their overall grants to 
to be spent on. And that's how it's about sustainability. Does it tackle the overall kind of conservation investment we have to have? Uh, I would have to have uh, significant increases in my funding uh, for my portfolio to do that, but I'm sure with the support of the committee, uh, you know, we can make that case because it's not just about buildings, it's about the places, it's about the tourism, it's about the economic sense, and we cannot have um, that disrepair uh, continuing. Um, but it's a big challenge, it's not easy, and I'm sure when you went to Orton you realised some of the challenges are sometimes insurmountable, uh, but we, we need to do what we can. But I'm happy to take more, Mary, because I know this is a big... Um, uh, just my final challenge. question, um, given that we've uh, talked about the previous budget reductions, uh, it's likely that Historic Environment Scotland will seek funding uh, from sources other than the Scottish Government. That has the potential to squeeze out other bodies. Uh, and is it also feasible that Historic Environment Scotland could be offered a donation that may have gone to another body? Uh, you know, so would they be Historic Environment Scotland? Would they be expected to refuse? a donation uh, in terms of uh, the wider interest. These are the conflicts, uh, potential conflicts, that have been raised with us. Um, well, under the current arrangements, Historic Scotland received donations from members or from people who want to donate. In budget, are they likely to encroach on territory that uh, you know the National Trust, Historic Houses and others are currently getting money from? Okay, well, I've said over the period their income level has maintained. Right? Their income level, we're not, you know, so you're seeing their budget reductions not in terms of their overall income levels. I mean, they've just had a, a fantastic Easter, for example, which will have helped um, boost resources. But, you know, we've tried to, as, as part of our stewardship of this is to, you know, we've got to work within the envelope we have. And in terms of the income levels from um, Historic Scotland, they've managed for their overall expenditure to maintain their position. You know, you're suggesting that in the future there would be continuing budget reductions. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the overall uh, economic position would improve. I'm hopeful in terms of the next few years that, you know, the economically Scotland for... Reductions. I was talking yeah, about yeah. the reality. So, but what you're assuming is that that's going to continue. Now, you know, no, you I didn't say that. See that. Well, sorry, oh, that's what I, I thought that's what you were saying. But in terms of going forward, you know, the, the, if we're trying to, as much as, 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 as possible, maintain the status quo in terms of their overall facility to spend resources, I think the, 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 the number of your question is, are they going to be in competition and are they going to, you know, in terms of the territory? They already are to an extent, um, both for income and visitors. However, I don't think, if we, t if we see this simply in terms of um, an internal competition for a limited... Um, resource, then I think that's the wrong way to look at it. The whole point of the strategy is that we actually need to grow the sector as a whole in terms of both the tourism, in terms of the income from different areas. And because Historic Environment Scotland will be charged as a lead body, they shouldn't be doing anything that would cause anybody else any, any difficulty because then they wouldn't be carrying out the functions of being um, a lead body working in collaboration. Um, they already, for example, Heritage Lottery, Stirling Castle received a significant amount of funding um, through Heritage Lottery. It's not a displacement, of course, because that should always be for additional lottery funding, should always be for additional resources and different additional projects. But actually, in terms of um, where they go, I, I, you know, I, I, they are doing very well in growing their income. I would like to see a growth in the income coming to all properties in historic environment from growth in visitors, growth in the economic um, uh, tourism areas, and that's where the income will come come from. In terms of trying to be, you know, predatory, you know, I, I noticed, you know, I don't, I don't think the, I don't think there's a, any expectation by my part, or indeed by the new body, that somehow this is then, um, you know, giving them a different uh, new opportunities to do, um, you know trying to displace funding. I think the idea is to try and grow the funding rather than displace it from, from any one particular source. But I think it's wrong. I think there's some quite interesting... I can't remember if it's historic houses themselves said, look, that already exists in terms of, you know, either getting donations from people or visitors. There's already that. Now, what we want is to have a healthy, competitive situation that people can work in collaboration to say, if you're coming to Stirling or you're coming to Orton, you go and see all the different cross-ticketing or cross-promotion. That's the big prize in growing the the sector, but I think to say somehow that they would be um, trying to take other people's donations, I think is the, is the wrong way to look at it. And I wouldn't, it's certainly not my expectations and what I would expect. Indeed, my letter of guidance that I will set out for them is the, the importance of working together uh, in collaboration with, uh, with, other, with other people. 
Gordon MacDonald. Before I go on to my, uh, my, other, my own questions, uh, just a bit of clarification. Can, can you just confirm that um, over the last three years to March 2013, that cumulatively um, both Historic Scotland and ARCAMS have actually <coughs> operated at a surplus? So therefore, that, you, your, your comments about um, the balance or between uh, more commercial revenue against government funding um, it would be correct that they've been able to maintain the, their activities? Yes, they've been able to maintain their activities from the resources that we've provided, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, so from, the overall, from the overall income, yeah. as you set out. Yeah. I just wanted to put on record that they've actually yeah. generated a surplus over the three-year period. Um, regard, regarding my own questions, we've, we've talked, you've said about um, Mary Scanlon's questions, a concern uh, about displaced funding if the new body was to get charitable status. And certainly we've had um, a range of views about it. Um, National Trust for Scotland uh, was obviously concerned about charitable donations. Uh, however, the Association of Certified Field Archaeologists said the prospect of unpicking the charitable status that already applies to elements of the proposed organisation appears to be nonsensical, is their comment. So what I would like to ask is, um, given... Uh, I know it's an, a decision for the new Historic Environment Scotland to decide whether they apply for charitable status or not, but do you see any financial benefits for any new organisation going down the charitable status route uh, that wouldn't have any impact on other bodies' income? Um, well, the answer to, to that last point is yes. Uh, I think that's probably where Mary Scanlon was getting at, and I'll try and cover that point as well, as whether having a charitable status would have an impact, which is different from the establishment of the organisation itself. We've established... The, the bill uh, um, is set in a, in a way that should the new body wish to um, apply for charitable status, it could. I think the evidence from... It was quite important evidence from the... The, the, the body just quoted in archaeology in particular because, particularly in the ARCAM size, uh, that, that has been a big issue for them and being able to have an uh, opportunity to have charitable status. If you look at the financial memorandum, I was quite clear, you, you know, in terms of the, um, the ability of this new organisation to carry out its duties and its functions. And again, I will re reiterate the, the reason for doing this is so they can sustain their functions going forward, um, was that whether or not the new body either applied for or received charitable status, it could function with the resources that it has going forward. So obviously anything in terms of a charitable income would be a bonus uh, going forward. In relation to most of that would come from rates relief, for example. Um, uh, that's what they would be able to, to, to apply for in a way that they can't Currently, that has no implication for other organisations in that area. So most of the activity uh, in terms of the area would be in relation to things that wouldn't have an impact on you know, other organisations in, in their operations. So that's, again, that's set out in the financial memorandum. There isn't in the financial mem memorandum um, you know, a kind of large section that's saying, well, you know, we'll, we can only do this if we receive X amount in terms of charitable donations um, so there's a kind of figure in terms of the, the current existence. They've got charitable donations already. Um, they've got donations come in in terms of being able to apply that in a charitable way, and that would be helpful. So in terms of gift aid donations, you've got um, over 10 years, and that's a 10-year period. I mean, if you actually look at financial memorandum, it refers to 300,000, which over the period is, is 3 million over a 10-year period. I hardly think that's going to threaten NTS, bearing in mind the already um, Historic Scotland already receives charitable donations. That's what's budgeted in the financial memorandum. OK, thanks. Um, one of NTS's other concerns was about the number of staff that are involved on fundraising and commercial activities. And... I'm just wondering if you're in a position to clarify what um, the proportion of staff would be that would be involved in um, commercial activities and tourism uh, of the combined body. And in producing the um, outline business case, was there any suggestion that that number of staff would need to be um, increased that proportion of staff that are working in commercial and tourism areas would need to be increased in the new body? I don't have the figures to hand as to how the, the, the current distribution of 
who's in what, unless somebody can, or my officials can, can find it for me in relation to how many are employed in the different areas, but I can certainly come back to the convener with, with that um, in, in writing. Um, there wasn't anything that would, would said going forward that the, in terms of the business plan going forward, in terms of the operation, um, we're taking the, the current situation of Historic Scotland and rolling it forward. Now, bearing in mind my answer to how have the Historic Scotland in particular coped with um, some of the grant reductions um, from, Scot from the Scottish Government, is there has been a reduction in staff, but it's done not by compulsory redundancy. We've managed to maintain the public sector uh, position of no compulsory redundancies, but all the most of the changes that have taken place have already taken place before we got to what to setting out in the bill. So, in terms of, if you look at the financial memorandum and going forward, it already incorporates what the changes that have happened to date. So, it's not there's no um, modelling that says in order to realise this financial stability security going forward, we will automatically have to increase our income from visitors and events by X percent. That's that, that's not part of what's in the in the financial memorandum. It would be if it was, it would be explicit. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Following up that, that point um, that Gordon McDonald's just raised, I mean, obviously um, there's been a, a period of change within both organisations leading up to, to the merger. I suppose the concerns that were being raised with us was that um, that income generation um, is, is likely to be um, more of a priority even than it has been in, in the past, whether it's in terms of growing the cake overall um, through, through collaborative action uh, or whether it's, it's allowing um, uh, HES to, to, uh, to, 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 to fund other aspects that to date have been difficult to fund and therefore I suppose what um, those who have raised the concern um, have highlighted to us is what the implications of that are for the uh, regulatory dimension of what um, HES will continue to be responsible for and whether it applies, it would it likely to apply pressure to their ability to, to carry out those functions um, in, a, 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 in an efficient way. Well, I've already answered in relation to the scheduled monument uh, consent aspects that there already is a, a process clearance already, but it will become more explicit and transparent and they will be decisions will be published. So that will again be more um, you know, in terms of the comp there will be no compromise in relation to that. In fact, if anything, you'll be, it'll be more open as to what those decisions are. I think you make the, there are certain assumptions, I think, in your, your first sentence when you said there'll be more of, there'll be more of a priority um, for income generation from uh, for the new body, that that isn't as a result of this bill. That's not a result of this bill. If you know, it, it, if there's more of a priority, it would be the same pressures that are on NTS and historic houses because we know that they'll need to um, you know have constant um, investment in, in in the sector. So that's not as a result of the bill. That's a, a, you know that's the real politic of you know what they have to deal with. I suppose those bodies obviously don't have, at the same time, a, a regulatory uh, function. Now, if the, if the income generation aspect of what um, HES is involved in uh, grows and, and, and requires uh, additional staffing to help support that and promote it further, um, uh, that, it, I think the proportion between those involved in that, um, uh, that work and those involved in the, the, the regulatory functions may well change um, and, and, and the proportions won't necessarily tell you whether there are an adequate resource there to, to discharge the regulatory functions as, as, uh, as we would expect. Well, that, that, that comes back to the point about where is ministerial responsibility and scrutiny. Uh, that would be an area I would take a very keen and active interest in. And again, that would be subject to you know, looking at the corporate plan and looking at you know, my letter of guidance, my relationship with them. And I'm accountable to you in, in, in relation to that. So if there was any kind of movement that we weren't satisfied in relation to regulation, absolutely we would, uh, in terms of you know, my ministerial responsibility, um, be very concerned about that. I don't anticipate that... The, the, the impetus for that doesn't come from this bill. Um, that would that would still be the same kind of that would still be the same um, pressures that would be on Historic Scotland now. Actually, if you didn't if you didn't have the bill, what you're asking would still be a, a pressure on Historic Scotland, even if we didn't go ahead with the bill. So, although it's an, an important argument for the wider historic environment agenda. I, it's not affected by what's in this bill and those internal pressures between balance between regulation and um, other, um, I suppose, tourist attraction visitor. That tension would still exist even if we didn't go ahead.
with that bill. I think with the bill, actually be more explicit, in fact, what the regulatory function is and the decision making, etc. And there'll be more transparency than, than there, there currently isn't. Um, the, other, the other area to, to uh, look at is also in relation to designation and regulation, which we haven't touched on, is what, the, what it does or about well. to. <laughs> well, the appeal <laughs> mechanism is precisely to make sure that if there's anything happened in that area, not only be transparent about it, the appeal mechanism <laughs> to ministers in relation to um, those areas will also provide an opportunity for us to be quite clear about what we expect. So. Uh, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, on the evidence session uh, on the 18th of March, um, Diana Murray, in response to a question to Jane Baxter, who asked her about who is ultimately responsible and accountable for successful delivery of the strategy, uh, Diana Murray said, it's uh, difficult to say because we do not have the new body operating, but I imagine that the intention is that there will be a partnership between the new body, which will deliver the strategy and able the partnerships, all the people in the sector, there are many, and of course the government, we will work in collaboration. And on page 3031 of the strategy document, it says that there'll be a three-tier delivery model uh, to deliver this strategy. Could you tell us exactly where accountability lies okay. in the strategy? Well, in relation to, you've got, this, is, this committee session is about the bill, um, and so it obviously is in context with what's happening with the overall strategy. Your question is about the overall strategy. The overall strategy will be ultimately um, government will drive forward that strategy. We will establish, I have set out, a strategic board uh, which will have not just obviously the chair of Historic Environment Scotland which we're establishing in this bill and which we're scrutinising today. It will also include um, many key uh, people from the independent sectors and charities etc. So the idea of the strategy is, is a collective one across, uh, across the sector. Um, so the strategy, the, the, the strategic board for the strategy, the board for the strategy will come, be all-encompassing. Um, within that, uh, the members, for example, NTS and others, have their own internal governance arrangements, and they will continue because they're independent organisations, as are historic, you know, houses association, etc. For the purposes of the bill and the organisation, um, the bill, um, we will, uh, with the agreement of Parliament, should Parliament want to go forward, we will then um, establish a board for Historic Environment Scotland that will be uh, have a chair. The uh, government ministers will appoint the chair and the board, and they will drive forward. Historic Environment Scotland and the bill sets out their role um, and functions and it's the role and functions of the, the new body Historic Environment Scotland um, is set out in the, in the bill itself all of which will contribute to the wider um, Scotland wide uh, if you want to call it uh, first ever Historic Environment Strategy Could I just ask on that point in, in respect of the functions within the bill if the new body uh, the, the board uh, had uh, a difference of opinion about the overall direction of the strategy, given the uh, directions that are set out in the bill, who has the ultimate say in what that strategy will be? Or how well, uh, I, I, if there was a difference of opinion, then um, I'm sure we'd have re robust discussion um, with the All Scotland Strategy Board. Uh, what we've managed to achieve is consensus of the way forward, the priorities that we have to take forward, and that's what gives us the blueprint uh, for going forward. If there were differences of opinion, then I would have the, those the discussions with the uh, chair and the board of Historic Environment Scotland, but I would expect in their corporate plan that they would be supportive. Uh, I would expect them to be supportive of the strategy if there was differences of opinion, as they are with... I don't know what, think about other sectors, that this, you know, whether it's natural environment or Scottish enterprise or whatever, you know, that's the, the normal relationships between an NDPB and a, a, a government would pertain in terms of how you resolve what they are. If they are genuine concerns that have got a, um, a big bearing on the strategy, then obviously we try and influence uh, other members that they might want to change the strategy. But, you know, on the basis we've just delivered it and we've got consensus over it, I expect for this foreseeable um, future, the, you know, the Board of Historic Environment Scotland will be delivering the strategy as set out. Cabinet said, I, I'm sure no. in, in the vast majority of cases there probably would be agreement, but in a circumstance where there, there was some uh, difference of opinion about the overall direction, is it the Scottish Government that has the final say on what that uh, direction should be? Oh, yes, it, yes, it, yes, it would be. And are you comfortable that the charitable status of any of the bodies who were represented on the Board would be... Um, 
uh, absolutely clear in that circumstance? Well, that's where it comes back to what we need to do in relation to um, the, what we can do in, in relation to uh, the charitable status and ministerial powers of direction, because it's the overall strategy. It's not about specifics. Clearly, ministerial direction is about specifics, whether it's to do with collections, whether it's to do with the, um, the management of their activities. What you can't have in terms of um, uh, charitable status... Uh, you know, the, the, dis the disapplication of the charity's investment um, uh, legislation will take place should the new body wish to apply for charitable status. Now, we're not, you know, I don't know if the board will, uh, it will be up for them to decide, but the process of doing it is it would be, it would be in a similar situation as the other bodies that are in the charity, the, the, the disapplication has applied to in the charity legislation. Can I say we have had uh, discussions with Oscar. Uh, they can't obviously make a judgment until such a, if an application takes place, but we're very conscious of the points that you're making to make sure that what we do in the bill would not compromise the new body should it apply for as as as, as well as we can. I mean, we can't prejudge what Oscar will say or do, but we can have discussions with them, make sure that they're cited on what we're doing, and that's exactly what we've done. And we've, we've drafted the legislation in such a way that it shouldn't be compromised by any decision that um, Oscar could take in the future. But I think it's a good point, a very good point that you're raising. OK, um, just one final uh, point of clarification. Um, Kate Maver, uh, National Trust, uh, said, if, if we are to set objectives and outcomes, this is in relation to the governing board, and expect people to be accountable for them, we need to make sure that the funds are available to enable the delivery of these outcomes. It's not yet clear where that money will come from or how it will be distributed. Could you comment on that? Um, well, in terms of the grant giving, we'd expect that to continue um, rolling forward. And obviously, I've mentioned NTS has been a, a recipient of um, a significant amount of grants um, over recent years. In relation to the big picture of, say, for example, um, skills, we're already investing a lot. And again, I'll do my pitch for please go to St Andrews Square and see the young apprentices up there doing their, doing their work. Um, we've already tried to marshal resources into skills with the apprenticeships through Historic Scotland and the wider Scottish Government in this area. Um, we're already investing in the engine shed in Stirling in terms of looking at the conservation skills there. Um, rather than it just being um, something that Historic Scotland did themselves, we'd like to work with other bodies like NTS saying, OK, how do we do this for the whole sector? Um, is it clear where the resources will come from? A lot of it will have to come from what we're doing already. Um, but actually, if we set out um, what we need to do to deliver the strategy in terms of well, what does that mean for skills? What does that mean for different areas? It allows us to quantify what it is that we need to do and then obviously bid for resources to, to make that happen. But some of it will come be self-generated, I hope, from the increased tourist activity that we're seeing across the piece. But some of it will have to come from a nation that is absolutely understanding that if they want to have a built heritage going forward that is uh, you know, accessible, that people can visit, um, and is there for future generations, there will need to be investment in that sector going forward. And I'm sure this is an issue that we'll come back to from, from the area. I think NTS is quite right to say, look, there are big challenges here, and I absolutely agree with them. There are big challenges. But rather than people trying to tackle that in isolation, what we're trying to do with the strategy is bring everyone together because there are strengths across the sector and, and we can take uh, responsibility from it. But it's, everybody has to, to, to work on this. But um, you know, we're, we've, we've managed to, to provide very good stewardship over um, the recent period um, by lim you know, with the limited resources we have. Um, but I, I think we need to look at the big picture going forward, and I, I want to share that leadership with other bodies, and that's why I think NTS has a key, you know, key role in this as well. Thank you, Ed. Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, uh, to continue the discussion about governance, um, there was concern raised by the Society of Antiquities of Scotland regarding the current members of Historic Scotland. Um, they suggested that uh, members have previously had the opportunity to contribute to the governance planning and decision making within Historic Scotland and to the scrutiny of these matters. Um, is there a role for the 131,000 members of Historic Scotland uh, within the governance structure and, and if so, what is it? How do I say this it's tactfully? Um, I think we've just been discussing National Trust for Scotland. I think one of the issues that the Reid report, George Reid's report, looked at was actually the relationship between hundreds of thousands of members and your government structure. And they obviously quite clearly made considerable changes to make sure that they could run their, their new body in a, I suppose, in a, in a way that's more um, 
fit for purpose in, in contemporary fashion. Um, the obviously, I suppose it's more a question for Instruct Scotland how they re relate to their members. Um, they do take se very serious regard to the feedback they get on a regular basis about what they're interested in. Um, they've got a very active and interested membership. You'll see that from those of you, I'm sure you receive the, the regular um, magazine and the regular uh, conduct. But you know, this is a public body, it will be an NDPB, it will have to be run in a way that we expect others to, to be run. And um, in terms of the ex experience, um, obviously we'll be setting up the new board. I'd also like to put on record my, my thanks to both the commissioners and the existing um, Board of Historic Scotland for their work in taking us to where we are and also we've got a kind of transitions board that is particularly looking after the interests of staff and other areas going forward but it's very important that we set up the new body with the new board with experience um, I'm not sure that's where the evidence when I was reading the evidence from the, the Society of Antiquities came from that obviously we don't want to designate there will be somebody responsible for archaeology or somebody responsible for antiquities the board will have to be drawn from people of experience but also of interest um, across the piece and we would want to make sure that that board is balanced and has um, different perspectives but we won't be designating you know reserved places for, for, for different people. I'm not quite sure if that's what the evidence that was presented to you was addressing. But um, the, the valued me members of Historic Scotland, of which I'm one, um, uh, I think I was the first culture secretary who was already a member of Historic Scotland before uh, I took on the post. Um, but a uh, you know, very uh, valued, valued uh, organisation and the membership is that it gives it a lifeblood, actually, in terms of um, activity and um, visitors and in terms of the numbers and I think what's really interesting that although we've had a bit of kind of well you know challenges facing the sector if you look at the membership increases of both um, NTS and Historic Scotland in recent times they've been really healthy really healthy so uh, again I think that's a, a good signal for the future that people value their their heritage and they want to visit their heritage and they want to contribute it to so but I think that's a good question to ask the body going forward and again as part of the corporate plan they'll set up how they will the relationship they'll have uh, with their membership the already historic Scotland already do that but obviously that'll be of, of interest going forward at how that continues okay thanks so much uh, thank you much um, thank you much cabinet secretary for your evidence today there are a number of areas that we won't be able to cover in this morning's evidence so if you don't mind we will follow up in writing um, on a number of points um, I, I'm sure there are uh, follow-up questions from the discussion this morning but also from some of the questions that have been raised in written evidence too many to deal with uh, in an oral session but so we will write to you and your officials and um, to try and follow those up can I uh, not only thank you but can I ask you and your officials to just sit um, in your place just for one moment while we deal with the next item just so we can deal with this um, our next item today is to consider three negative instruments the Additional Support for Learning Sources of Information Scotland Amendment Order 2014, the Children's Hearings Scotland Act 2011 Modification of Subordinate Legislation Order 2014, and the Adoption and Children's Scotland Act 2007 Compulsory Supervision Order Report and Applications for Permanence Orders Regulations 2014. Uh, do members have any comments to make on any of these instruments? No, you don't? Okay. Um, therefore, does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instruments? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes the public part of the meeting and we now move into private session. Thank you.